Hi, I'm Joe Saunders of Miniature Landscape Hobbies, and in this episode, we're going to talk about Battlefront's new book, Flames of War, Eastern Front, Mid-War Forces. Flames of War, Mid-War. It's a great game. It's set in an interesting time period, has great units, and has a top-notch rules mechanic. But despite this, I don't play it very often. Why? Well, I'm a tank guy, and the real heavy hitters tend to be in the late war supplements, so that's where I focus my time. I think nothing truly beats the tracked vehicles that are just massive. They're great as a model building opportunity or a chance to wreak some chaotic fun on the games table. Because of this, I stick to the light war supplements. But I'm happy to say that's all about to change. Battlefront is about to release a supplement for the mid-war eastern front for Flames of War. I was happy to get a preview copy so let's jump in and take a look and see what secrets we can discover. Do you need custom diorama quality terrain made for one of your projects? My contact information is in the video description. Eastern Front Midwar Forces is a huge book, 361 pages. Like most of the Midwar books, it's also an anthology of the previous Midwar offerings that were released earlier in 4th edition. Within it, you'll find the previous content from Iron Cross, Ghost Panzers, White Death, Hungarian Steel, Brave Romania, Enemy at the Gates, and Red Banner. These are all collected together for convenience, and as I alluded to, there are some awesome additions sprinkled throughout it sort of like candy nuggets of war game goodness dispersed through the chocolate bar that is Flames of War. Yum. But first, I guess there's an elephant in the room that we should talk about. The vast majority of this book is content that's reprinted from the previous books. And so, if you have the previous copies, then this book has less to offer. Most of the new additions that you will find in the book are in the form of adding the mid-war monsters. This is kind of divisive with some players because they want to stay 100% historical. These new units mostly represent prototypes or extremely rare vehicles that either saw little or no real use in the war. So playing them could be seen as stretching the historical credibility of the game. Despite this, the ultimate decision to buy the book is up to each gamer, so you'll need to ask yourself if you want to trade out big armor awesomeness and the increase in variety for the realism of historical gaming. One thing you can't deny is that amalgamating the reference material in one spot on its own is likely worth the price. This will let you avoid trucking around the reference material, and save your arms and back. So with that out of the way, let's get into what we can actually see inside the book. As with all Flames of War books, Eastern Front Forces is nicely laid out and looks great. There's a mountain of background material, and there are tons of maps. This makes it fun to read and very interesting. As most Flames of War players are also armchair historians, the history covered should be considered more of a primer that whets your appetite for more. This is awesome and provides fertile ground to grow your historical interest. The first portion of the book covers German forces. You'll see the regular units we all know spanning up to the Battle of Kursk. You will also see that the force organization chart is now combined to include both Iron Cross 
and Ghost Panzer options. This makes it very straightforward for the German player to set up his force and limits the need to jump back and forth between separate books. Okay, but what you actually want to know about is the new units, and there are some good ones. First up, you see the Dicker Max. This is a tank hunter with a ridiculous gun. At AT15, 2 plus firepower, it really packs a punch. This is going to destroy any mid-war allied vehicle, except maybe some of those that we'll discuss a little later. The Dicker Max, though, is a glass cannon in every sense of the word. It's open-topped and lightly armored. It'll hit hard, but it can't take a punch itself. Now suppose that AT-15 is maybe not excessive enough for you, for some reason. Then you can use the Stir Emil. In many ways it's similar to the Dicker Max, except its gun is even more ludicrous. At AT-20, fire power 2 plus, this is going to put a hole in anything. Interestingly, it has a 48 inch range, so it can sit back to offset its front armor, which is only 5. With an AT of 20, maybe you should just use it to play Team Yankee though. There's also the Bunker Flak. This is another way to get a high AT gun in the form of the familiar 88mm cannon, in this case mounted on an outdated half track. There are two wild card units in the book as well. There's the Tiger P, which we previously saw in the Mid-War North Africa supplement. This is pretty much like any other Tiger tank, but adds some variety to your force. The other vehicle is the Panzer I Infantry Tank Platoon. This vehicle is nifty. Four dice of machine guns and a front armor of eight. This little tank can take some punishment and do a number on any nearby enemy infantry. A specialized tank for sure, but a fun option if your opponent uses Russian infantry hordes. Now we arrive at the options for the allies to the Axis cause. The Finnish, Hungarian, and Romanian forces. These options offer a major way to shake things up for Axis players. Why? Well, it has to do with German stats. In Flames of War, German troops have nice, solid, reliable statistics that make them excellent all-rounders. This is good, but maybe kind of boring, too. They're effectively the ultramarines of Flames of War. Their allies help shake this up. The Finns are really high quality troops, but their equipment is subpar. The Hungarians are like discount German troops. Decent, but not great. The Romanian troops? Well, they're the bargain basement type. Their special rule, Entitled Peasant Army, means that if you're lucky, the occasional unit will be good. But most won't. The result in game terms is variety, and tons of it. The Finns bring interesting, if outdated, tanks to the game. You want to throw a T-26 or a T-28 against an IS-85? Go ahead! The Romanians and Hungarians have some very different artillery and armor, and using the Axis allies you can even add cavalry to the game. Some specific units in this section are worth investigating, as there are new additions you don't see in the earlier Axis allies books. First we see the Hungarian section with the addition of the Zerini assault gun battery. In late war flames of war, the Zerini is present, but with a howitzer. Here it has a 75mm cannon, providing basically an equivalent vehicle to the German Stug. This is pretty cool, and adds some good anti-tank to the Hungarians' choices, but it's also a fanciful unit. 
The only 75mm Zerini that was made was a prototype. So this unit is not of the historically accurate variety. Personally though, I don't care. Next is the Romanian TACAM 60. And yes, I probably said that wrong. It's an anti-tank vehicle platoon. The TACAM 60 comes in the form of a wildcard unit, so you won't see many of these on the table. The vehicle is based on a captured T-60 tank with an added, also captured, 76mm cannon. This provides the Romanians with an AT-12 weapon to help make up for the fact that they suffer when it comes to taking on heavier armored vehicles. It's worth noting also that the TACAM-60 is from a later period in the war, but it's conceivable that it could have been finished earlier and fielded around the time of the Battle of Kursk, which is why it appears as a wild card only. Now we get to the Soviet forces, of which there is about 100 pages of details. The content for the Soviets, therefore, is suitably vast and varied. Like the German section, it starts by combining the red banner and enemy at the gates formation charts together to make selecting units easier for your games. As always, you see things like T-34s, big infantry hordes, and T-43 tank battalions. Hold on. T-43s? That's new. The T-43 is an up-armored T-34. They go to front armor 8. This is a value that's pretty serious by mid-war standards. Otherwise, it's your basic T-34. This tank is interesting in that it's not a complete fantasy, but a prototype successor that did not see deployment in the real world because by the time it was to go into service, it was undergunned. Moving on, and beside the T-43 in the force organization chart, we see another unusual option, the IS-85. The IS-85 is not new to Flames of War, but it is new to mid-war. Previously, it was only a late-war option. It appears here as the tank came into use just at the tail end of the period covered in Eastern Front mid-war forces. Because of this, it's not entirely out of place. It's also a formidable heavy tank. Front Armor 10 makes it more resistant to attack than even the Tiger 1, and its 85mm gun is AT-12. By mid-war standards, this vehicle is an apex predator on the battlefield. Appearing in the book is also the KV-3. This tank was never deployed, but it came close, so it was included in the book. What's it like? Well, picture a KV-1 with a 107mm gun. This is a slow tank, but it also has a front armor of 10, so it can take some serious abuse. Add to that the fact that its cannon is AT-14, and you have a vehicle most Soviet Flames 4 players will be rushing to add to their collection, even if it isn't truly historically accurate. Finally, the Soviet force section also introduces a new wild card, the KV-5. This multi-turret vehicle is nearly a complete fantasy. A prototype was started in 1941, but was not finished. It also would have weighed around 100 tons. The stats on this machine speak for itself. Front armor 14 and an AT-14 gun along with five machine guns, makes it pretty formidable. Maybe the most formidable vehicle in the game. It also costs a lot of points to field. But, like the Sturer Emil, you don't field this because it's sensible. You field it because you can, and then you can enjoy what happens in the game. This brings us to the end of the tour of Eastern Front Midwar Forces. The book finishes up by showing some excellent large model sets that will be out soon and provide good value for gamers who want to either start Midwar Forces or bolster their existing collection. 
Overall, I think this book is excellent, and in my opinion, it adds enough new content to make purchasing it a good choice, even if you have some of the previous books reprinted inside it. One thing that I am a little disappointed about is the lack of the city fighting rules that were previously in Enemy at the Gates and Iron Cross. These made Stalingrad and other urban-based battles really fun, and they remain one of my favorite additions to the core rule set for Flames of War. However, you don't have to miss out completely, as I'm pretty sure you can download these rules as a supplement off the Flames of War website for free. If I can find the link, I'll put it in the video description. So there you have it. I'll be back soon with more painting and terrain tutorials. But for now, I have to go buy a KV-5. Why? Well, it's a 100 ton tank, so how can you not want to have that in your Russian force? Even if in real life, it really wouldn't make any sense. Miniature Landscape Hobbies is your source for miniature, terrain building, and diorama content. And we can't do it without your support. We want to build a community to ensure that the wonderful art of building a miniature is accessible to everybody. To participate, please consider joining on Patreon. For $4 a month, our Patreon members benefit from 10% off at Joe Saunders Terrain in the Etsy store, 5% off paints and hobby supplies at Torchlight Games, free access to STL files, a mention in our credits, and early access to our videos. Please check it out and consider joining. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Please remember to subscribe, press the bell button so you get immediate notification on our videos, and until next time, remember to keep building life in miniature.